Let's watch Jonald Harris. Turns out people are saying that uh, this is a pretty good one. Do the Palestinians have a right to a separate state? No, I don't think they do, but... In 2007, the head of military intelligence for the Israeli army had a meeting with the U.S. ambassador in Tel Aviv. We're looking at the classified cable that summarizes what was talked about in this meeting. The topic of discussion was Iran, Syria, the Gaza Strip, and Hamas. Hamas had just won the Palestinian elections, which kicked- Okay, right off the jump, I don't know why Johnny always does this. Like, even when he talks about, you know, America's allies, or if he's, like, criticizing Israel or whatever, he just always neglect to mention, like, America's involvement every step of the way. I find this to be rather odd. I don't know if it's by design. I don't know what's going on there. Maybe he's setting it up. ...off a fight with the other Palestinian group, which ended in Hamas taking over Gaza completely. They controlled it. And if you're an Israeli citizen or the U.S. government, this is a terrible set of events. A Hamas is a... Like, every part of that process is directly uh, America's fault, more so than Israel. And believe me, I will always tell you, when Israel has done something wrong, I will tell you. This is one of those instances where America's own framework, America's own uh, opinion on the matter, George W. Bush's own opinion on the matter. No, not even allegedly. This is not alleged. This is not alleged. America thought PA is our guys and we can bring PA in. We should do an election. The PA people said, don't fucking do that. We do not at Fatah have enough support from the population. They know we're corrupt. They think we're like working with Israel, which is true. They think we're America's dogs, which is also true. That's why they were having the conversation with George W. Bush at the time. And, uh, and George W. Bush was like, no, 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 don't, don't listen to me. Uh, I mean, I will not listen to you. Just do the elections. You'll be fine. And then the elections happen. And of course, Hamas ran on an anti-corruption ticket. They're like, listen, we're the new guys. Like, I promise, like, we never work with Israel. We will never work with Israel. We're, the, we're not corrupt. And then they won by a 3% margin. And then America was like, oops, that really fucked up. That really <laughs> wasn't great, was it? And then what did they do? Oh, that's right. They took literally... The PA guys kidnapped a bunch of Hamas dudes and tortured them alongside the CIA, mind you. And then they tried to do a coup to forcibly overtake uh, uh, the Gaza Strip and forcibly rip control from the hands of Hamas. And of course, you know, they lost in that coup and Hamas took over the entirety of the Strip. That was objectively an American failure. I'm sure that it corresponded to Israel's interests at the time, but a lot of what he just mentioned in the first 47 seconds were almost entirely George W. Bush's fault. Known to commit heinous violence against civilians in Israel, and they were now in power. They controlled the Gaza Strip an hour away from Tel Aviv. But look at this leaked document. In this leaked cable, you see that the Israeli official says that Israel would be happy if Hamas took over Gaza, because it would mean that Israel could now treat Gaza like a hostile country. Fair facts. Not even a joke. Good job from Johnny. Fair. This document is a view into a strategy that right-wing factions within the Israeli government have used for decades in an effort to win one of the most divisive conflicts in the world today, in which two groups are fighting over one piece of holy land, and one side is winning by using a very specific tactic, one that the world says is illegal and immoral, and one that worked for a short time, but that recently has been shown to be a recipe for even worse violence and conflict and suffering. Okay. In this video, I wanna lay out what this strategy looks like and show you how it failed. For 2000 years, Jewish people around the world have been persecuted and segregated and ostracized from society. True. That is a fact. By the time the 1800s came around, it became clear that wherever the Jews went, persecution would follow. This is when a movement emerged calling for Jews to come together and to create a country for themselves, where they could govern themselves and be free from all of this racist hatred. The big question was where? <laughs> Several places floated around in proposals, oh, he is. Argentina, even modern-day Kenya, which back then was Uganda. But most people in this movement wanted the Jews to return to their historic homeland, a place called Palestine. I mean, I think, like, the the... OG Zionists were not exactly like super religious or anything. I mean, it was not an accident. They were definitely way more like on board with the colonialism aspect than they were about uh, the religious aspect. As a matter of fact, I think that the reason why they were were uh, down for 
uh, Palestine was because they could personally tie it to some kind of like um, Judaism argument and maybe get the more religious Jews on board who were not on board with going to Palestine at all. There was also a, a lot of different types of Zionism at the time, which people point back to. Like, they'll be like, Einstein was a Zionist. And it's like, dog, literally things that he said, I say and you claim is anti-Semitic when I say it, you know? Like Einstein, who was supposed to be the first president, right? Uh, who is a socialist, by the way, uh, straight up said about the Irgun and Haganah and the other militias that they were insanely violent. And and that uh, like his Zionism was very different than the way we understand Zionism now. He very openly, yeah, he 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 very openly condemned the, the militias and said that that is not what it's supposed to be. Where Jews built their temple and their culture 3,000 years ago, but then were exiled. And now there was this call to return so that Jews could feel safe after 18 centuries of Jewish suffering. So as the 1900s came around, tens of thousands of Jews, mostly from Europe, flocked to Palestine which eventually came under control of the British. The British were getting ready to leave this region Please don't and look were struggling up. to contain the growing conflict between native Arabs and all these Jewish immigrants. Then in the 1940s came a horrific genocide against the Jewish people in Europe, led out by Hitler and his Nazi regime. This created a wave of international support for this idea of giving the Jewish people a homeland where they could be safe. Before they left, the British asked the UN to determine what would replace them in Palestine. And the UN decided that Palestine would become two new countries, one for the Jews and one for the Palestinian Arabs that had already been living in this region. The Jewish state colored light, the Arab state dark, Jaffa to go to the Arabs, Jerusalem internationalized. But as happens when outsiders draw lines on old land, there was a problem here. Within these borders that were meant for the new Jewish country, hundreds of thousands of Palestinian Arabs were living who would soon have to leave their homes to move to their side of the line. Jewish militias forced over 700,000 Arabs out of their homes, turning them into refugees. The proposed borders shifted around, turned into ceasefire lines, and after all was said and done, the Jewish people did indeed get their own country, the state of Israel. And the two important points here are that number one, the very foundation of the Israeli country is for security of the Jewish people after nearly 2,000 years of persecution. And number two, the location they chose to set it up was becoming, as a result of this conflict, not much safer than Europe. That's a tension that follows this whole story. Okay, so now let's fast forward to 1967. <laughs> Dude, there's a lot of stuff that he is just... Yeah, why did, why did it become, like, less safe for Jewish people? Surely it was all the immediate anti-Semitism that the, the Arab Muslims and Christians felt in, deep in their hearts across the board. That's probably what it was, I assume. And definitely not, like, the massacres and the displacement. He literally said he won't talk about all the details in this video. Sure, is this true? That's true. Israel has Fair. its country and they fight a short war with their Arab neighbors and they win that war and they take over all of this land. <coughs> a huge victory for them. I'm gonna take away the Sinai Peninsula from here because they did give that back to Egypt as part of a peace deal a few years later. Israel now controls important pieces of land that enlarge their Jewish country. Many saw this victory as a sign from God that they were actually entitled to be here. But once again, Palestinians, nearly a million of whom had been kicked out of their homes, were living here in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which Israel now controlled, but they weren't really sure what to do with it. And it's this territory that would become the stage for the strategy that is the topic of this video, where over time, this land would be sliced up with roads and checkpoints, walls and other military infrastructure that would control the movement and lives of the Palestinians. Soon, even Israeli citizens would start to move out here in large numbers. Moving citizens into occupied territory like this is something that the world has deemed illegal and immoral. So this occupation starts in 1967, and it goes on for decades. I just said map Until eventually, perpetrate. the Palestinians living here can't handle it anymore and they start fighting back. The Israeli government would respond by cracking down, killing many Palestinians. No, this is like, guys, this is not a bad assessment. Sure, uh, there's aspects of this that he like skipped because it's, you know, there's a lot of details to slam into 24 minutes, but it's shockingly insightful so far. And I don't think betrays uh, pal the Palestinian humanity 
at all. Important thing that happens around the same time. Down in the uh, occupied the bar, Gaza Strip the is that so a new low. movement forms, promising to fight back against this occupation, calling for the destruction of Israel. The group is called Hamas. The first intifada showed that this wasn't going to work. Chopping up Palestinian land, oppressing them, keeping them in this occupation was only going to produce more violence. It wasn't going to fulfill Israel's promise to provide security and safety for the Jewish people. They had to switch course. The security of the Israeli people will be reconciled with the hopes of the Palestinian people. I literally agree with this framing. This is, again, Rabin seeing a necessity for peaceful negotiations as a security measure is literally better framing than like Israel decided to be kind out of the kindness of their hearts. And Rabin is like a peaceful dove who just loves Palestinians a lot. And there will be more security and more hope for all. So in the 1990s, they start getting serious about peace talks with the Palestinians. And they come to this agreement called the Oslo Accords which for the first time establishes a Palestinian government authority and giving it power to govern pockets of land in the West Bank. It also gave the Palestinians some authority over almost all of the Gaza Strip, though there were still settlements in all of these places. This was a big deal for this conflict. Like both sides were talking to each other and coming to agreements that was giving like authority to the Palestinians. But another theme of the story is that hardliners can use violence to derail peace. And that's exactly what happened here. Right-wing Israelis start holding rallies, calling their prime minister a traitor and a Nazi for giving land to the Palestinians. Some of these rallies are led by a now familiar character, Benjamin Netanyahu. But the peace talks continue. And shortly after signing the second part of this deal to give Palestinians some land, the Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin is assassinated by a far-right Israeli. Hamas conducts bus bombings, and the next year, Benjamin Netanyahu is elected as the Prime Minister. Yeah, okay, there's, uh, you know, there's some stuff in between there that lead to Hamas switching away from military targets directly to civilian targets and, and doing the famed bus bombings. That part, I think maybe he doesn't know, because to be fair, not a lot of people know that. I don't think that was like a lie by omission, but I think that that's probably the uh, the the uh, massacre of the mosque happens in that time frame. And I think that he did not mention that. This is when Hamas decides to change its, mil um, change its militant targets to uh, civilian targets as well. Netanyahu is a key figure in this story because his worldview embodies a way of thinking that has taken root in Israel in recent years. The idea that the only way to give true security to the Jewish people is by doing whatever is necessary to stop the Palestinians from having a state anywhere in these borders. Nobody wants peace more than Israel, but the stumbling block to the road for peace is this demand for a PLO state, which will mean more war, which will mean more violence in the Middle East. And I think, I sincerely believe, if this demand is abandoned, we can have real and genuine peace. So that was Netanyahu when he was a 28-year-old. And then he goes on to explain what his real thinking is on the situation. <laughs> Netanyahu is a fantastic Bro, really watching the Tete Tete uh, coverage, like, that's crazy. Isn't that from uh, the Turkish radio television broadcaster, Tete Tete? Politician and statesman, and he's able to sort of cover up a lot of these policies in the name of security. But here we see what he Damn. really thinks as he's talking to these settlers. Based Turkish broadcaster, Turkish recorded. national broadcaster so, defender Johnny Harris. Palestinians come to the conclusion that the Israelis aren't really serious about giving them any kind of autonomy in the West Bank or Gaza. That their situation will never change. And once again, they rise up in a second intifada. This one much more violent, much more coordinated. Hamas becomes a major player in the violence with suicide bombings, and attacks. Then in 2005, Israel withdraws from the Gaza Strip, letting the Palestinian Authority have total control there. They turn their attention entirely to their historic homeland of Judea and Samaria, which is the West Bank. The next year, an election is held in the Palestinian authorities, and the winner surprised the world and would create a new chapter for this conflict. The winner of these elections was Hamas. <laughs> Very bad results for the Palestinians More openly and raised. for Israel. <laughs>
The incumbent Palestinian party that had lost the election tried to forcibly hold on to power, and soon the two Palestinian parties were fighting with each other. And it results in this split between the two Palestinian governments. It turns into violence. And when the dust settles, there's suddenly a bitter divide between these two Palestinian groups. And this gets us back to our leaked document that we started this video with, where an Israeli official is saying that they would actually be happy if Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, because now they can treat Gaza like a hostile country. Now that they're not occupying it, they're not responsible for the two million civilians who are living there. Hamas ruling Gaza and the West Bank being run by a more moderate, secular Palestinian faction. And crucially, neither considered the other to be legitimate, which weakened their ability to negotiate for any kind of state, for any kind of country, especially when Hamas still refused to- This is shockingly good from Johnny Harris. Nice. Maybe some liberals will learn a thing or two. They do love him. Recognize and... Israel's right to even exist. This division. Yeah, Johnny Harris is more like Johnny Hamas. Right dude. What's the happening hands here? Of the Israeli right. And this gets us back to Benjamin Netanyahu, that enemy of the earlier peace talks. He gets elected once again in 2009, declaring himself Mr. Security and promising to provide safety to Israeli citizens who are still shaken from the Second Intifada and are now worried that Hamas now controls the entirety of the Gaza Strip. And this is where we get to this paradoxical alignment, almost alliance, between Benjamin Netanyahu and Hamas, the enemy of Israel. As long as Hamas held control over the Gaza Strip, the Palestinian cause would remain weak and divided. Netanyahu would feel justified in imposing this crippling blockade of the Gaza Strip, which in turn gave Hamas legitimacy among the people of the Gaza Strip, showing that their armed struggle against Israeli oppression was justified, provoking them to launch rockets into Israel to show that they were actually doing something, unlike the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, which in turn bolstered Netanyahu's narrative that the Palestinians actually don't want peace, they want violence and the destruction of Israel. And the only way for security is more occupation, more oppression. So instead of try to take Hamas out, Netanyahu overtly supported them by approving huge transfers of untraceable cash literally delivered in suitcases into the Gaza Strip, cash that would inevitably end up in the hands of Hamas to be used against Israel. He legitimized Hamas by negotiating with them releasing a thousand Palestinian prisoners in exchange for one Israeli. The more Netanyahu could keep Hamas in power in Gaza, but keep them contained, the more he could ensure that Palestinians remain divided. Dude, I feel like people are gonna yell at him for this. I mean, I guess he's doing the, the classic, like uh, everything is actually Netanyahu's fault, which it's not the case at all. And it it completely betrays the notion that this is like an, a, an extension of Zionism like the Zionist project Netanyahu might be a far-right shithead but also he is continuing along the agenda of Zionism you see all these settlements going up the international community can't do anything about it they keep supporting you every once in a while there's some flare-up in the West Bank where Palestinians get into a fight with Israeli soldiers but it, it gets contained that's not how that works no it's settlers deliberately go and fuck up uh, uh palestinians and their farms and shit like that and then the idf comes in and cleans up every few years hamas fires some rockets which then gives israel the excuse to go as they put it cut the grass by conducting a short swift violent military campaign to keep hamas at bay and every day that goes by, the notion of a Palestinian state becomes less and less feasible. Maybe this violent status quo, this equilibrium can hold, and the far right can get exactly what they want. It's security for the Jewish people and expansion into all of this land. And maybe the occupation will break the Palestinian spirit, and they would give up on their dream of having a state. But that's not what happened. On October 7th, 2023, we saw how wrongheaded this theory of security was. In an unprecedented surprise attack, the militant Hamas rulers of Gaza sent dozens of fighters into Israel by land, sea, and air. This deadly attack launched by Hamas showed us that while Netanyahu's strategy of divide and conquer might be good for taking over more land, what it's not good for is making good on the original promise of Israel, which is ensuring the security of the Jewish people. In fact, his strategy has produced exactly the opposite. Now, the responsibility for what happened on October 7th lies with the people who committed those acts of terror, Hamas fighters and their leaders. 
there is no excuse or justification for their actions. But the point I'm trying to make with this video is that there's also others that need to stand accountable here. Those who used Hamas as a pawn to continue this divide and conquer policy, who are now engaged in a campaign of mass bloodshed on civilians, they deserve to stand accountable as well to the Israeli people and to the countries that support Israel. I believe in the need for a Jewish state. I do. I think that's a very reasonable proposal that Jewish people should feel safe somewhere in this world. Yeah, I don't think it's Hamas's fault. Like what's happening in Gaza is not Hamas's fault. It's not. You don't blame Osama bin Laden for fucking uh, what happened in Afghanistan, or I guess some people do, or Iraq. The people that blame Osama bin Laden for Afghanistan and Iraq are fucking ridiculous. Did I misunderstand what he said? World, I think to the kids, they deserve to announce with this video. No excuse or justification for their actions. But the point I'm trying. Oh, he's saying Hamas is responsible for October 7, not what came after. Okay, fair facts. God damn, my bad. Damn, dog. That's like this is literally something that his like target audience would probably yell at him and call him anti-Semitic for. I believe in the need for a Jewish state. I do. I think that's a very reasonable proposal that Jewish people should f like that. I don't agree with if there was like unoccupied land, certainly. Okay. But that is a tricky situation. When you say, I believe in the need for a Jewish state, you end up giving a major concession to the Zionist project that dictates that even in its like most theoretically peaceful capacity still has to maintain demographic control over Israel, implying that you can't have too many Arabs. You can't have too many Palestinian citizens of Israel that are not Jewish. So what do you do then? The necessitation of a Jewish state is at the heart of the violence that Israel conducts. Like, I don't know why he described all of this and said, I think there needs to be a Jewish state. 